OK. Uh, shall we start? Uh, OK, so uh, my name is Andre Rosa. I'm a software engineer working for Starburst. Uh, I'm also a Trino maintainer and a Presto committer. And today uh, we're going to discuss Trino as an engine for large scale batch and ETL processing. Uh, so in this presentation, we're going to provide some insight into what Trino is, how it is related to Presto. We're also going to take a quick look into uh, Presto slash Trino history as an engine for uh, large scale uh, batch ETL processing, and also dive deeper into some of the challenges that are associated with uh, this type of workload. Uh, we'll also discuss new execution capabilities that we are adding to Trino uh, that are designed to address all the challenges associated with batch ETL. And we're also going to cover the status of ongoing development, what we've uh, already built, and what we are planning to build in the near future, uh, leaving some time at the end to ask uh, questions. So first of all, who, for those who are not familiar with Trino, let me give you some very high-level overview of what Trino is. So Trino is a, data, is a distributed data processing engine that allows uh, to process large data sets distributed over uh, one or more heterogeneous uh, data sources. And it also provides an X, uh, NC SQL compatible interface for, for doing computation. Uh, so in other, uh, other words, uh, it, Trino is a, a data lake engine, so it supports all modern uh, data lake formats such as Delta Lake, Iceberg, Hive, Hoodie. Uh, it is also a query federation engine, uh, so it allows you to query data from more than 40 uh, popular data sources, and such as MySQL, Cassandra, Apache Pina, uh, Apache Kafka, and many, many, many more. And it also formerly known as, as Presto SQL. So before we dive deeper into history of Trino, I think it's worth mentioning its direct predecessor. So basically Hive was uh, the first attempt to provide a SQL compatible interface for large scale data processing. Uh, it was built on top of Hadoop. Uh, it is an open source implementation of MapReduce. And introduction of Hive it generally it greatly simplified the development process for uh, this uh, large scale data processing. So with Hive, it was no longer needed to write, compile, and deploy Java code every time you needed to do some, uh, some, some analytics or exploration. So what the user end up writing instead is just a simple, uh, SQL compatible uh, query. Uh, however, Hive on its own, it was still running on a MapReduce platform. It was mainly designed for this like long running batch processing. So it was fairly slow for, uh, for interactive workloads and the actual experience was nowhere near interactive. Uh, so querying Hive, it was, it was very tedious and time consuming process. So basically how you usually look, you submit a query and then you wait for a notification in the form of email or something else telling you that you know, your processing is done, you can go and check your result. And if in case there was like any error or any problem, you had to start this process over again. Uh, so this sing a single iteration could have taken hours, depends on the load of, of the Hive cluster. And there was this anecdotal observation from data scientists at Facebook. So I was, I was initially introduced at Facebook. Then in 2012, they were able to only execute as, as much as six queries a day on average. So that wasn't really convenient for interactive exploration and debugging and, and building their pipelines. So it was clear that a better solution uh, was needed for interactive querying. And in 2012, Martin, Dane, David, and Eric started working on Presto. Uh, so effectively, it provided an alternative to Hive for interactive querying at Facebook. And some of the key development philosophies uh, philosophy were uh, the open source uh, model. So the project is 100% open source. Uh, a lot of effort was put into making this project just work. 
so it doesn't need any like external it doesn't have any external dependencies such as map reduce framework or anything else you just deploy it and it and it runs uh, it was designed for fast and interactive analytics and uh, a huge uh, uh, effort was put into making it uh, strongly adhere to uh, to open standards like ANSI SQL, JDBC, and and so on. So everybody pretty much who knows uh, SQL and knows how to deal with a JDBC compatible database was able to run their analytics. Uh, so in 2013, uh, Presto uh, went live in production for interactive use cases. And uh, soon after, engineers outside of Presto team, they built integration for the batch processing platform and started uh, submitting uh, batch EDL queries to Presto as well. Uh, so uh, at, at first, it might have seemed a little counterintuitive. It's like, why would somebody prefer Presto, which is designed for interactive, uh, to, uh, to run any, any kind of batch processing? Uh, so there, there were, of course, like other engines like Hive and Spark that was specifically designed for, for batch processing, designed to be reliable, and, and, and so on. And there were mainly two reasons. So basically, first was significantly faster. And uh, there was a second, I would say not le less important reason that I'm going to talk about is but but before before I describe the the, the, the second reason, I'd uh, love to walk you through uh, an anecdote from my life working as an engineer on Presto. Uh, so very often, uh, if I wanted to understand, uh, uh, if I wanted to debug some problem or better understand, uh, like you know, some slowdowns in query processing and so on. Uh, uh, I had to pull up some runtime information about some specific query. So, for example, a user uh, reach, reaches out to us, says that you know, my query is, is running slow or is failing. Here is query ID. Could you please go and try to figure out what, what's going on? So we actually had this data set called Presto Query Events, and it had like, a whole bunch of runtime information about all queries that, that were running in the cluster. Uh, so what I usually did, I went and queried this data set by query ID to extract uh, like, you know, some runtime statistics, query plan, uh, and, and whatnot. And these queries uh, were usually like very, very fast. It's like maybe like a second, maybe a couple of seconds. So we were able to iterate quickly. But uh, sometimes the information in that table wasn't enough and we needed to look more into uh, additional information provided by the systems we integrated with, like for example, the Metastore, or uh, or let's say uh, a storage subsystem. And usually, how how did we do this? We wrote a join based on some like trace token that was joining these two data sets and provided some consistent view about this specific query. Like for example, by looking at this data, I was able to understand that, okay, for this query, calls to the meta store were slow, or maybe there was some problem with the storage subsystem. And as, as we joined more and more these different data sets to provide more, uh, more information about this query, like the runtime, it, it grew significantly. So when the original query was running only like a couple of seconds, a query that was joining all this, uh, all this data sets could have run for like 15 to like 30 minutes. So that was like no longer interactive and it was not as easy to iterate fast when your query runs for like 15 minutes. And what, what we usually ended up doing is we went and tried to create a scheduled ETL job that used to run once a day or once an hour, depend on the uh, on the data freshness. Uh, and this job used to join all these data sets and create a single table uh, that had all these events grouped by query ID. So then we we were able to query this this extended data set with the same latency of a couple of seconds. Uh, so. And basically converting an interactive query, so let's say we have already built an interactive query that joins all these data sets and we, we decide to create a scheduled pipeline. 
so converting this query from Hive, uh, to, from Presto to Hive, it was like, it, it was full of challenges. So uh, you, you had to convert SQL because the SQL semantics is slightly differ. Uh, you have to convert UDF. Sometimes the exact UDF wasn't available, so you had to find a workaround. You need to run it several. You needed to run it several times, verify the output data set to make sure that we are getting the results we are expecting. And often, like if we needed to uh, query some other other uh, data sources, such as Cassandra or MySQL, or basically everything what is not Hive, uh, it wasn't even possible to convert it to Hive because Hive may not have supported this specific data source. So it actually, this solution came out pretty naturally. So basically, you just copy your uh, interactive query, paste it into a batch processing tool, and voila, you have a, uh, you have a pipeline. And that, that was actually, this integration was done not by the Presto team, but it was done by some, uh, uh, by some data uh, engineers that, that basically wanted to have pretty much this. Uh, so yeah, uh, so basically the second reason why do people wanted to run uh, their batch ETL queries in Presto in addition to Presto being much faster is a single unified SQL interface. Uh, however, very soon we realized that basically ETL workload comes with its own challenges. So speaking very generically, uh, very generally, uh, ETL queries tend to be much larger than interactive queries. Uh, so, for example, uh, people tend to create some very large dimensional tables or differential tables. And very often, these queries, they use a lot of memory because of like very large aggregations and joints involved. Uh, some queries, they require really a lot, a lot of CPU time for processing because sometimes people end up, uh, let's say, transforming some less efficient file format into more efficient, so they end up scanning and transforming very, very large tables, like you know, hundreds of terabytes, maybe even petabytes. So these queries tend to be very long running in certain cases. And uh, one more challenge that we discovered uh, is the resource management. So what if the scheduling system submits multiple memory intensive or long running queries concurrently? Uh, as, it, as the scheduling system may not really know about resource requirements of, of this query. So it was like very easy for the scheduling system to overload the cluster. Uh, also to better understand why uh, these uh, large queries are challenging in Presto, uh, uh, it, it is important to understand uh, Presto execution model. So in Presto, queries are split into multiple stages by the planner, and each stage has a whole bunch of uh, tasks processing their own uh, chunks of data. And uh, the data exchange uh, between tasks in Presto is performed in a streaming way. Uh, so basically, all the tasks are required to run all at the same time. So with this execution model, uh, this, this execution model allows you to achieve very low latency, and it introduces no overhead, so there is no checkpoint in Vault Nothing, just network exchanges between, between tasks. Uh, but at the same time, uh, with this execution model, a query is required to be executed all, or, all at once in this like all or nothing fashion. Uh, so basically, this all, of, all at once aspect imposes very uh, significant restrictions. So for example, uh, since all tasks must be running concurrently, it increases the, uh, the amount of memory that must be available in the cluster for processing. Uh, it also makes it not possible or very difficult to tolerate uh, failures. Uh, so in case, uh, even a single, in, in case uh, of a node crash or maybe some like very long GC, or some other problems if any of the nodes in the cluster crashes, that's pretty much wipes out the entire cluster because uh, all, all tasks are interconnected. So as long as one task is lost, the entire query is lost. And resource management was like an, another big challenge. Uh, so uh, if cluster is overloaded, uh, it is not possible to suspend a query and resume it uh, after resources are, are available. 
So instead, if cluster is overloaded, we had to kill one or more queries to let the other queries succeed. And this could be really, really wasteful, uh, assuming this, these queries are, are resource uh, intensive. Uh, so like the solution to this problem was to pretty much deploy very, very large clusters. So we used to run 1,000 node clusters with 256 gigabyte of memory on each node. So it makes it far less likely for the cluster to run out of memory. Uh, each of these nodes had a lot of processing power that was kind of re reducing the amount of queries that running for a long time. And also for resource management, what we figured is that we can limit a single query to only be able to utilize up to five to 10% of available uh, memory in the cluster. And with that granular granularity, we were also able to build a resource prediction system and the, uh, and the resource of our admission preemption policies based on predicted resources. Uh, well, basically, the idea was to keep these queries relatively small uh, to the, uh, with respect to the available resources and manage resources on per query basis. And with this model, we were able to scale it pretty well. So we, we, were, we uh, were able to support queries that need up to 10 terabyte of distributed memory, queries that run for several CPU years. And we were also able to support quite a high concurrency with up to like 80 queries running on the same cluster. Uh, so up until now, we've been mostly talking about Presta. Uh, but the presentation says Trina, uh, so you might be wondering what is Presto, what is Trina, how they relate it. Uh, so uh, Presto was originally created by Martin Dane and David and Eric at Facebook in 2012. Uh, and in 2018, uh, the original founders decided to leave Facebook and focus on building a community-centric project. So they created a fork called uh, Presto SQL that was later on rebranded to Trina. Uh, but the Trino in its core is still the same project led by uh, the same uh, core engineers. Uh, so uh, at some point, I also decided to leave Facebook to join the founders at Starburst to work on uh, Trino. And uh, when I joined Starburst, I was quite surprised to learn that Trino is not very widely adopted for uh, ETL batch in the broader community. Uh, uh, so it was, I, we, we were trying to understand like why, why is the hesitancy, what are the problems? So together with Brian John, who also happened to be my former uh, Facebook colleague, uh, we conducted a number of interviews uh, with Trina community as well as with Starburst customers to better understand the hesitancy, to better understand what problems people are facing and why they prefer other engines to, to run ETL. And we ran like a bunch of these interviews and then we started identifying some common patterns and those were pretty much uh, the same problems. So basically people were mentioning memory constraint queries. So it was, uh, they were mentioning that they need to scale the class, they, their cluster up to support like let's say, a single memory intensive query that they have in their ecosystem and it was not very cost efficient. They also mentioned long running queries. So sometimes when queries fail, when they run for a very long time and then fail, they have to restart that and it breaks the landing time expectations. And uh, uh, another, uh, another problem that was mentioned is basically resource management. They had a strong ex expectation that the engine should handle uh, a resource management for them and they have to do nothing. So they basically just want to submit their queries and not to worry about overloading cluster and so on. The expectation was that the engine does that for, for them. Um, and unfortunately, this workaround with deploying very large cluster and managing resources based on uh, a query granularity or by simply providing more memory to better address memory intensive or long running queries, it wasn't really feasible because a lot of uh, companies in the community, they, they run very small clusters. They run clusters of like 10 to 20 nodes. So when we, when, so deploying a cluster with a thousand nodes and running 80 queries concurrently was something that wasn't even up to a consideration. Uh, 
that being said, it is also worth mentioning that uh, some companies uh, are already running Trino for ATL quite successfully. So for example, there is this like very good article from uh, uh, Salesforce about how they're running their ETL in Trino. So the idea is that they are trying to uh, trying to avoid large queries. They are trying to structure their, their workload in a way that all queries are approximately the same in size, memory-wise, CPU-wise, and they are fairly short, basically up to like 10 minutes. Uh, but the, the problem with this approach, with, with trying to avoid uh, large queries, is that uh, you, you, need a, you need a team of highly skilled uh, data scientists and engineers to properly structure your workload. And some workload cannot simply be broken down into, uh, in, into smaller parts because some, some algorithms are simply not incremental. And sometimes you really need to run a very large query to compute, let's say, a yearly report uh, of some kind. Uh, so we set our goal to uh, improve Trino to provide an out-of-the-box ETL solution. Uh, the goal was to provide uh, necessary execution capabilities to handle queries of uh, any size, no matter how much memory intensive or CPU intensive are they. And we also needed to provide a resource management built-in in Trino that just works. Uh, so very soon we realized that existing execution model relying on streaming exchanges is just not flexible enough for us to provide all this, to, to solve all these challenges. Uh, as with streaming model, the entire query ha is required to be executed as a single unit, uh, preventing us from applying more advanced uh, scheduling techniques. Uh, so uh, after careful consideration, we decided to remove this limitation. Uh, so the idea is uh, to introduce an, an exchange buffer in between stages. And this would allow each task to be run independently. So this buff buffer is, uh, is something that is fully pluggable and abstract from the engine point of view. But the point is that there is, there is some buffer now in between the stages that, that uh, allows uh, task scheduling as uh, as, a, as like atomic independent units. So there is no longer, it is no longer necessary to schedule the whole query as a, as a single thing. Uh, so basically allowing uh, to run each task independently opens uh, a lot of interesting opportunities. Uh, like uh, one of them is it allows us to reduce uh, the memory required to process a query. So if you look at uh, uh, this query, let's say it has six, six different tasks that, run, that use from like 17 to 30 gigabyte each. So with streaming, you'll have to run them all at once and you'll need at least 212 gigabyte of memory available in your cluster for, for this query to succeed. But with new execution models, since you can run one task at a time, uh, you only need 30 gigabyte of memory at peak uh, for this for this query to succeed, uh, so it also allows to implement uh, a fine-grained uh, failure recovery. So with streaming execution, since all the tasks are interconnected and have to run all at once, failure of any of this will result into a failure of the entire query. So the entire query has to be restarted. But if each task is independent, uh, we can uh, basically restart on task level, saving a lot of resources. Uh, speaking of resource management, basically when managing resources, there are two important parts. Uh, so one is how do you estimate how much resources uh, a certain unit of work will take? And the second is how do you decide to schedule and when and uh, when you make a decision whether a certain unit of work will fit or not. So with resource estimates, uh, when each task is an independent unit, it also simplifies resource estimates a lot. Because think of a query being submitted to a cluster. Pretty much the only thing you know about this query is that it reads some number of tables, let's say two tables with a total size of something. 
uh, 20 terabyte in this case. And when you try to predict resource utilization, it is like very, very difficult to say how much memory is this query going to need or how much CPU time it will going to take. So uh, uh, you can try to employ like maybe some cost-based optimization techniques and, and so on, but these tend to be not very reliable. And the problem is that the uh, that the cost of misestimating is very high. So if we mispredict the resource utilization and schedule this query on a cluster that doesn't have resources to process it, we will have to kill the entire query and start over. But when you are able to schedule it, each task independently, what you can do, you can try to, you can better estimate resource utilization for a single task because you know exactly how much data is this task going to read. Uh, so, for example, if it reads uh, the total of five gigabytes of data, uh, then it's like very unlikely that it will use more than five gigabytes of memory. And if we are wrong, if it does end up using more memory than we predicted, it's not a big deal. We can just kill uh, this and a successful attempt, increase the reservation, and restart only a single task. So the second part is, of course, the resource allocation. So let's say we have a Trino cluster with five nodes. We know how much memory is utilized and is utilized on every node. Uh, and when a new query is submitted, we have to give an answer. Okay, can I run this query right now on this cluster? So first of all, the resource uh, estimate is difficult. But let's assume that you build some, uh, I don't know, uh, some external history-based system that is able to provide you resource estimates for a certain query or a pipeline. Uh, you still need to give an answer, okay, is this query going to fit in, in this cluster that is currently utilized uh, in, in a certain way? And this, this is also, this is kind of not an easy question to answer because uh, all the tasks have to run in parallel. You have to bin pack these tasks in a way that is efficient and so on. And of course, if you are wrong, you have to, you have to kill this query and start over. That is, that is not ideal. But again, if you, have, if, if you have an ability to run each task independently, it's much easier to, it is, it is a much easier decision to make and a much easier question to answer whether you can schedule a single a certain task. And again, if you're wrong, if you decide to schedule a certain task on a certain node and you realize that there is not enough resources to run the task, not a big deal. You can kill a task and start it over uh, later on. Uh, also, what, what it also makes easier is the resource sharing uh, between two queries. Uh, so basically to share uh, resources between two different queries uh, with the new execution model, the scheduler simply has to maintain an equal number of tasks uh, running for uh, all the queries that are active. And since all tasks are sized uh, approximately, uh, to be approximately, approximately similar in size, and they are relatively short running, uh, we can balance the resources between, between queries pretty easily without wasting a lot of work. But with the old model, when, when uh, the queries are all at once, uh, there, is, there is not much you can do if a cluster runs out of resources. So either query one or query two has to be, uh, has to be killed to let the other query uh, proceed. Uh, so the new execution also makes it much, much easier uh, to implement adaptive optimization techniques because it allows uh, queries to be suspended at, at, at any point, pretty much. So what you can do, you can suspend a query at, at, at a point where you need it and, and replan it. Uh, so one of like the classic runtime optimization is, is the adaptive join reordering. So think of... Uh, an incorrect joint order picked by the cost base optimizer because cost base optimizer is not always ideal. It is, it is possible that it may pick an incorrect joint order. So what you can do, you can basically run the scan stage for one table, run the scan stage for the other table, and then suspend the query at that point, check whether uh, the joint order is correct, whether the smaller table is to the right. That's what we usually try to do in, in Trino. And if the join order is incorrect, you can replan and resume the execution without, without wasting uh, any, any, any work. And with, with this optimization, we can do many interesting things. So basically, we can adaptively reorder joins. We can adaptively 
switch join type from both broadcast to partition and vice versa. Vice versa. Uh, we can also add some adaptive, adaptive skew mitigations, adaptive partitioning strategy to planning. Basically, there's many, many, many things we can do once we are able to suspend and resume queries at, uh, at any point of time. Uh, so you may be wondering uh, what is the uh, what is uh, the uh, buffer implementation we provide. So from the perspective, uh, from the from the engine perspective, uh, it is an opaque distributed buffer. So stripping out all the boilerplate, what engine, how engine uh, communicates with this buffer is is pretty simple. So basically, writer tasks they call write providing a partition ID and some. Uh, opaque bytes, and the reader tasks, they can read a certain partition by its ID. Uh, so that's pretty much how, how the engine operate, how the engine interacts with, uh, with the buffer. And uh, we also provide a very, very basic implementation for now uh, that is based on a distributed file system. So currently we support S3, GCP, and Azure. Uh, this is a very basic implementation, so it only supports up to 50 partitions. It also requires a full barrier uh, between stages. So the stage one has to be has to fully complete before we can start running stage two. It also introduces uh, important limitations that I will discuss a little uh, later. But this is just a basic implementation. So. Further down the road, we are thinking we are building the next uh, generation distributed buffer. So it will be a layered implementation that uh, utilizes distributed memory, SSDs, and only then it falls back uh, to a distributed file system. So this implementation will support thousands of partitions. Uh, it will also support low latency use cases. Uh, since we will be using distributed memory as much as possible and SSDs, uh, it will also significantly reduce overhead as we will no longer need to uh, always communicate with the distributed file system. And we are also planning to remove the full barrier uh, limitation with the, with the newer implementation. Uh, so the full barrier is very important to make uh, queries uh, Avoiding full barrier is very important to make queries like limit efficient, right? Because if you if you have a query something like select star from table limit hundred, uh, it's usually planned as a, as a set of partial limits on every task and then a final limit. But the thing is, if if the file if the, if there if there is enough rows produced for the file final limit to be satisfied. There is no need to run all the remaining tasks, but now since there is like a full barrier, we will still have to run all the tasks. So if we remove this limitation, we would be able to run a limit queries as efficient as it does the streaming execution. And it will also allow us to significantly reduce latency if uh, for not so resource intensive queries. So think of a query that just has two stages and six tasks in total. And let's say you have, I don't know, 100 slots, 100 task slots in your cluster. So you, you're actually able to run all of them at once uh, and, uh, to, to maximize resource utilization. Uh, but currently, since there is a full barrier, we first need to run stage one and only then we can run in stage two. So removing this full barrier uh, limitation is also important to to reduce latency of, of the smaller queries. Uh, so for the current status, uh, we fully support iterative scheduling. So all the primitives needed uh, to schedule tasks as independent units is already in the engine, so engine can do this. Uh, failure recovery is supported at task level. Uh, we also support advanced task-based resource management with all the resource predictions and resource-aware scheduling. Uh, we also provide this file system-based buffer implementation. This is, like I call it a proof of concept pretty much, just to uh, uh, need it for us to be able to iterate, but it is fully production ready and it can be it can be used and it is used by many Starburst customers. Uh, and community members already. And uh, currently we are working on this multi-layered -layer, buffer implementation uh, that would allow us to reduce uh, overhead and improve latency. 
And further down the road, we are planning to focus on adding all common adaptive optimizations, uh, implement micro-batch scheduling to further reduce latency, and to close the gap between uh, streaming execution and this fault-tolerant execution to make sure that it, it handles interactive use cases as good as, as the interactive model, uh, as the streaming model. So for early results, we were able to run a queries that would require five terabyte of memory uh, with streaming execution on a single node cluster uh, with fault tolerant execution. Uh, there are also community members that uh, experimented with uh, spot instances and uh, CPU based auto scaling in Kubernetes. And there is a company that reported more than 60% in cost savings by utilizing spot instances and auto scaling. And we also tested uh, this deployment under high concurrency. So we tested uh, on a TPC H 10 terabyte data set with 20 queries running concurrently on like a five node cluster. And it always succeeds and never runs out of memory. It is able to prioritize resources in a fair way. Uh, so the resource uh, uh, resource management primitives they they do work. Uh, so that's pretty much all I have for today. So if you're interested, please join our community. We have our Slack. Uh, we also have regular broadcasts, virtual meetups. Uh, if you're uh, interested in to contribute into the project, uh, visit our uh, development page. And you're more than welcome to write blogs or improve our documentation. And we are willing to give you some interesting swag as thank you. Uh, don't forget to give, a, to give us a star at GitHub. Uh, join the discussion on uh, Project Tardigrade uh, channel in our Slack. Also, you, you're, uh, you're welcome to ping me directly at Twitter. And you can come and see me and the team at the Starburst booth at this event. And yeah, maybe we can. It's time for Q&A. Any questions, anything? Yep. Okay, so the question was that for five terabyte join and aggregations, since it runs on a single node, does the node has to have five terabyte of memory available? Uh, no, uh, basically with this new execution capabilities, we are able to split a query into like multiple tasks and then we are able to run each task independently and iteratively. So effectively you just need one node with a 128 GB of memory and then you can schedule pretty much one or a couple of tasks at a time and not all the tasks that was previously required by the old execution model. Okay, yeah, so that works as an edge node, right? Sorry. Uh, so that works as an edge node, like it can distribute tasks to other nodes uh, and then aggregate all the results, not the entire thing, right? Uh, so basically, yes, uh, the, there, is, there is a single worker node, right? And you can schedule tasks iteratively to this node. And uh, what, what it can do, it can process, process one, ch one chunk of data, one part of data at a time, and write intermediate results somewhere in this buffer, right? And then a subsequent task will read it back from the buffer and do the further processing and so on. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, when you actually ingested the uh, the storage exchange barrier in between like stages, um, have you considered um, splitting, for, like for example, like some of the more complex tasks that, uh, for example, if you, you have two strategies to do it, right? So first thing is you split the task by partitions and then you schedule each one of these tasks one by one. Mm -hmm. The other way is uh, you run some of these tasks, like, like, like chop these tasks into smaller tasks, and then you insert a logical barrier or like storage barrier in between. So um, how do you benchmark against like two different types of logical plans or like physical plans in these type of use cases? So for example, if you're doing um, 
a join, and then after that, you're doing a, a kind of like a superset uh, group by on top of what already, already partition join. Logically speaking, you should group them into a single stages, but what if ingesting a barrier in between, then you can run both of those uh, tasks faster. Uh, how do you... Um, so basically you're asking, uh, the, the question is like, if you have a query that has a join followed by an aggregation, uh, you often, uh, you, you kind of need to make a decision whether to add an exchange in between, right? Assuming the, the partitioning uh, matches, right? Right. This is a very good question. So basically, today, what Trino does by default, it doesn't inject, it doesn't add an exchange. So in theory, you may run into a problem where you have a skew or where you have a task that is too big. And currently, there is a knob that allows you to change this behavior. So basically, you can tell, like, you know, whenever you see an aggregation or a join, always add an exchange. This will, of course, add an extra cost, right? Because now you need to run an additional exchange. So uh, this is something that we are planning to optimize by applying ad adaptive techniques. So we can be optimistic and run it without an exchange, and then we see if we run into a problem, we, we will try to split it. Right, and the second question actually is following up to that. Um, so you mentioned in one of your slides is saying that you're actually going to, in the runtime, rewrite your uh, logical plan or your physical plan, right? Uh, so does, yeah, I think. This one. Yes, so do you actually go beyond the split barriers in this case? Like, so do you actually um, planning to ingest a barrier in between? Because that's pretty hard if you're already starting the, the, the entire execution of tree, right? Uh, so th this, is, this is a good question. So basically, we are planning to adaptively split and merge stages, right? For example, if you decided to run a broadcast join, and then you see that like, you know, your build table is, is too big, you may need to split a stage into two. So this is something we are planning on doing. And the same thing for merging. Like let's say if you went with a partition join by cost-based decision, then you have to merge two stages into one. Uh, but this is still a stage boundary. So basically you run your build stage to generate a build side table, and then you can suspend at this point and decide what to do with the, with the join stage and prop stage, right? Uh, right, so the, the answer is like, uh, it's still done within the split, right? So your, your, your plan is still optimizing within the split boundary. Uh, within uh, uh, within, yeah. within, within, uh, within yeah, stage yeah. boundaries, yes. And if you switch from like a broadcast join to a hash join, then you pretty much need to throw away what you already done and then you have to run the entire uh, split. No, so you can, you can preserve the build side. So basically the idea is you run the build side and then you see, okay, how big is your big build side and what are the characteristics? Maybe it is skewed or whatnot. And then you suspend after that, after you run, after you run let's say, I don't know, uh, table two, right? Oh, yeah. So you are, you're basically suspending on the stage boundary. Yes. Yeah, but uh, if you already started up one task and you decided that, hey, this is not the right way to go, then you basically need to go back and then redo it in a different way. Yeah, but basically we don't have to redo the build stage. Oh, got it. Right. That makes sense. Because it's, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. If no one have another question, I have uh, one more uh, thing that I'm kind of wondering. In what kind of ETL workload that in your uh, customer research that requires a limit? Um, it requires a, a limit clause, like you mentioned that you're early terminating some of the subtasks, right? It, it, it does happen, right? Like for example, there are queries like order by limit. Oh, okay. when, you wanna, uh, when you when you want to extract a top and then maybe join with a top, right? It, it's not very common in ETL use case, right? But it, it, it does happen. Right, but in that case, you can't actually cancel the third task, right? Because you never know if your order... Like, yeah, so order if there is a full actually... stage barrier, we have to run all of them. Oh, and this is, this is a limitation today, but we are working on a better buffer implementation that would allow us to, to do kind of this pseudo-streaming, right? And then it will naturally resolve this issue. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for joining this presentation.